Corey Dick, think, you know, that's a great question. And I haven't seen all the bills, but I know there are some small ones that affect. For an example, the National Guard units stationed all over the state and are very important to small towns. When you have a unit in Prineville, Redmond, Bend, <coughs> other places, those are, um, those are uh, unifying. It's, for an example, in my district, you can go to almost any town and on a Friday night, everyone's at the high school. You really can't say that in Portland. Um, and so towns have sort of a cultural difference in some of those, and the National Guard is very important to that. We have several bills dealing with National Guard issues, one on recruitment that I dropped to give a few more tools to keep our numbers up so we maintain those missions. It's little things like that that have impact in rural areas that sometimes those who are from urban areas don't appreciate. Now, how does that change? It's incumbent upon me to explain it and to tell folks about it. And uh, frankly, I have found that when we in rural areas come to urban legislators and say, hey, this is going to affect us, the vast majority of time, it works. Urban legislators say, hey, had no idea, or you know what, that's a great point. Let's, you know, so there's generally, I think, a very good cooperative spirit mm -hmm. in that regard. Um, but the cap and trade and some of the other things do have real impacts in rural Oregon, and I don't know if we can find common ground yet. Um, but where we can find are the small issues that, you know, that have the ripple effect in rural Oregon that perhaps my friends in Portland don't always appreciate, um, but have always had uh, uh, an accommodating spirit when they are made aware. Well, I appreciate the, the sentiment that Representative McLean, I do think when rural issues are brought before the legislature and legislative leadership as a group has been very supportive of small and large bills. Um, because we think this is one state we should work together. What I will say is I hope in the interest of good policy that we have a fact-based conversation about the Clean Energy Jobs Act, and here's why. One of the things that really is important to me in that bill is to reduce our carbon emissions and mitigate the impact of climate disruption. We all know that climate disruption is happening. The places that are most affected by that are rural areas. As we mentioned, ocean acidification, what, you know, rising sea levels, all those things affect everybody on the coast. Drought, the need for better irrigation, more specialized irrigation to make sure that the water in the agricultural areas in the eastern part of the state are going to be able to maintain themselves as the climate changes. The goal of the Clean Energy Jobs Act is not only to reduce our carbon emissions, but to reinvest in our communities most impacted by climate disruption. And I will tell you that those communities are rural communities by and large. And we're gonna have a conversation about uh, carbon sequestration with our forests. There's a huge opportunity for the Clean Energy Jobs Act to be really good for this entire state, particularly rural Oregon. So I just hope we're gonna base it on the facts of how we can be reinvesting in those communities with this bill. Representative McLean, can we hear your thoughts on, on that? <laughs> wow, that, she's good. Um, <laughs> Uh, I was making a plea to support the National, National Guard at Which I'm fine with, by the way. Primeville, and uh, <laughs> she turned it into uh, that. You put up Earl? Well, true, fair enough. Um, uh, what is the phrase, a rose is still a rose by any of your name? Mm -hmm. um, or a stink? Well, anyway, the Clean Energy Jobs Act. I, I called it cap and trade. They used to, too, but then it didn't. Um, market as well and so they changed the name to cap and invest which for a cycler I guess that worked and now it's a clean energy jobs act um, so I'm not I, I think they're gonna stick with that name what the bill uh, you know we're gonna have to the, in a 35 day session I, I one I don't think they have the votes um, but two when you get down to the policy there's some distinct policy differences that we have. No one disagrees uh, with the notion of wanting to address some of these impacts that rural areas have had. Um, some of them are human caused by pol political leaders. Some of them are human caused um, by irresponsible behavior 
of um, manu you know, uh, industrial, um, and some of them caused by uh, climate change. So the question is, if we're sincerely focusing on how do we address rural Oregon and their problems, I think we have to look at all three. Now, if you're just focusing on that particular bill, then you know we could certainly pause and say, well, the fact is we've reduced carbon emissions in Oregon in the last 15 years by 13 percent. I believe that's what the number is. So, um, you know, we just passed a low carbon fuel standard. Well, they did. And uh, then I voted uh, with them to modify in the transportation package as part of a compromise. Um, in the last short session, we passed Coal to Clean, and now, uh, 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 another good name. They had to rename that as well. They're always heading to the word clean. I suppose that's hard to argue with, right? Um, but in the end, we have had significant <coughs> environmental legislation that's been named really uh, uh, clean something, and we continue to pass this. And um, so I just wonder how, what, you know, should we do it in the 35-day session? The answer is clearly no. I think it's violative of the uh, spirit of the constitutional amendment, but it's also uh, too much of a burden, and then fundamentally they don't have the votes. But I, I, I question, again, what Oregon's role should be and what is a consensus-based des desire, and that is to address harm to the climate caused by uh, human impacts. I think there are some better solutions, and um, but I don't. It troubles me that um, we're going to move this bill. I think the the speaker, if she had the votes in the house, would move the bill off the floor of the house in two weeks, three weeks. I mean, that's the timeline to get it to the Senate to pass it in a 35-day session, and that's an extraordinary ask. Um, now, you heard from Representative Williamson, they've been at this for the last, you know, 10 years, 100 years, 50 years. I, they've been at it, I mean, they, I, that number keeps changing based upon um, who's presenting. But their point is, we've been at this forever. As if somehow this is sort of a perfunctory step of, oh, let's go ahead and pass it, you know. No, they haven't been at it. And this is real consequences to Oregonians in a state that is a small state. And so I, I just wonder what, what's the rush. Um, and given the fact that we have consistently passed uh, legislation, as I mentioned. So that's some of my thoughts. I hope the Speaker of the House will uh, be mindful that the people of Oregon need to have a participating, participatory government. Um, and that's why the short session was designed to adjust our budget and to make some small policy adjustment into what we previously passed. Can I, can I respond to that? Um, so first, it does, we have been working on this since 99, so every session, it is a different year that we've been working on it because we continue to kick this can down the road. And frankly, you know, this is not, it would be a big ask to pass this bill in a two-week session if we didn't work on it last session, the session before, and haven't been working on it since last session in a bipartisan manner with over 100 people at the table working through policies. And so I think that to characterize it as this is a big bill that doesn't do all that much, and the emphasis being on clean, um, it, yeah, if it dropped out of the sky right now, it would be a big ask. But there's been a ton of work done by, um, by there, there's 100 and, uh, 170 farmers and ranchers who have been working on this bill, um, 800 businesses. There, there has been a ton of time and energy put into this bill. And you know, frankly, it's time to act. It's not, this doesn't go into effect the minute we sign you die. It, it's gonna take three years of rulemaking to move this program forward. And, and I would emphasize in the title of the bill, and yes, it is called something different than it was before, um, the jobs piece of it. I mean, the, the immediacy is not just about the environment. It is also about retooling our economy and how we get money into retraining folks 
and creating um, new industries and new economies so that uh, Oregonians in both rural and urban districts have the ability to be retrained for jobs um, and move this, this economy forward. It, we would be joining 10 other states, um, Providence is in Canada, so it's not like Oregon is acting alone by itself. We would be joining a Western energy market that already includes California. This is our ability to get ahead of the curve from some of our competitors and building these industries. And I think that's the piece that adds the urgency in addition to what the speaker um, and uh, what the Republican leader talked about around the, the environment and, and um, you know, climate change's impact on our state. I'm frankly very concerned about getting ahead of the curve on this economic development piece that this job will be investing hundreds of thousands of dollars into. The speaker 